is John Lake. In fact, it would be 99 years ago this weekend that John Lake got into an airplane. It was, the year was 1920. He was looking for a island that he could establish a leper colony. In fact, it was on June 18, 1920, when he was surveying the islands in the South China Sea. South China had become a home, or at least that area of South China had become a home for over one million lepers. Contracting leprosy in that culture meant immediate, kind of becoming an immediate social outcast or social death. And it was a slow, grueling, physical death. Leprosy would cause a horrible disfigurement. Hands and feet would would go missing, or the leprosy would, would attack the eyes or the ears or the lips or the nose or the hands, horribly distorted. And for 10 years prior to this airplane ride, Lake ministered amongst the lepers there in, in South China. And he primarily would bring them food or clothing. He would bring them the Bible. And as he began to develop relationships with those lepers, they began to ask him as he began to talk to them about his burden, about finding a place where he could provide a home, a, a place where they could call their own. And so they begged him to find a place that provided uh, water, where there was a, by the water so they could fish and they could farm. That's why he was in this airplane. A Chinese friend had recommended that he look for a nearby island. And in Lake's biography, he writes this, quote, like a jewel rising from the sea was the island of Tai Cam. There was only one problem, though, with that island. It was just a few miles offshore, but it also had become the base for the local pirates. And so being the brave missionary that he was, he decided he, to do the only thing that he could do, and that is to go ask the pirates if he could have the island for his lepers. <laughs> and so he decided to speak to them directly, and he, he writes this in his biography. He writes this, he says, quote, The inhabitants of the one fishing village on the island, some of whom are pirates of the worst type, but pirates, like the rest, listen to the gospel. And then he says this, listen, listen to this prayer. God grant that they may become our brothers in Christ and our allies in the work for lepers. And that's an important prayer because I'm going to come back to it later on in the message. And so with the help of an American businessman, and $5,000 later, he purchased this island for the lepers with an agreement that the pirates would stay over here and the lepers would stay over here. And actually what would happen is he paid the pirates to help build the homes that the lepers would eventually live in. You can see the pictures of it there. I'll tell you a little bit more about Lake and the leper colony later on. But there on that island, some people began, the, as, the, as the leper colony began to grow, many people began to embrace the gospel. Some people rejected the gospel, and some even considered the gospel. I would imagine in a group this size that there's probably people that reflect that. Some, many, many, and most have embraced the gospel. I would hope none would have rejected the gospel, but that too is a possibility. But I know that some are considering the gospel. And that's exactly what's happening in Luke chapter 10 for us this morning is Jesus is telling us the various responses to the Christian gospel, that there are some people who embrace the gospel, there are others who reject the gospel, and there are some who are even kind of considering what the gospel is, or what the, the, the components of the gospel. In fact, we consider this, right? The gospel is the defining message of the Christian church. So let me define the gospel so that we're all on the same page together. The gospel is this, that the one and only God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to restore what had been broken. What had been broken was this, is that His creation... His creation had sinned against him and had thus separated from him. Yes, our first parents, Adam and Eve, but let's not just blame it on Adam and Eve, for we ourselves have partaken of this holy rebellion against our Creator God. 
And because God is just and holy, He is therefore righteous to righteously judge His creation. But He did not stop there. In love, He sent His only Son to live the life that you and I could not live. That is to completely obey the law, the moral law, in every possible aspect, righteously and justly. He was crucified. Jesus was crucified on the cross and He was crucified for those who would believe and trust in Him. And the proof that God had accepted Christ's sacrifice was this, is that it was His resurrection from the grave. And the Bible commands all men everywhere to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is the gospel that was being preached by the 72 disciples in Luke chapter 10. This is the gospel that we ourselves proclaim. And this is the gospel that we long, if you have not embraced it yet, to even embrace it on this very day. Sounds like we're getting rain. This is our first rain in this building. and We can hear it on the roof now. And so I want to preach a message to you titled, Responses to the gospel, responses to the gospel. Would you look at Luke chapter 10 and beginning at verse 1? Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, where it reads this way. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two into every town and, and place where he himself was about to go. And he said unto them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. The first response to the gospel is this. Go and pray. And we find out that there are 72 disciples. Does that surprise you? We know that there were at least 12, obviously, right? But Jesus is sending out 72 I want to show you a, a, a map. Can you show me this map, guys? You guys, can I show them the map here? I'm going to show them the map. Where we go? One more. There we go. All right, I want to show you this. Uh, do you see that up here? Here we are. This is where in chapters 1 through 9, Jesus is ministry. And then, uh, uh, actually chapters 1 through 9, kind of more in this area. And then as Luke, the gospel of Luke goes on, and from chapter 10 on, Jesus is going to move south. And the reason why he's moving south is because he's heading toward Jerusalem. So the gospel of Luke actually moves geographically, if that will help you. And what we're going to be, we're going to be uh, moving down into this area right here. And eventually, uh, chapter 19 and on is, is where we hit at uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but I want to ask two questions. First of all, why 72 disciples? And then second of all, why did he send them out in twos? Bible scholars are in complete agreement on this, that the reason why Jesus sent out, was sent them out by seven, uh, sent out 72 was to reflect Genesis chapter 10, because in Genesis chapter 10, 70 nations are mentioned there, 70 nations. So Jesus is teaching his disciples this, that the gospel is not tribal. The gospel is not regional. The gospel is not national. The gospel of Jesus Christ is global. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is international. That he is not a regional God confined to one ethnicity or one language group, but that he is the God, and we put it this way according to the book of Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is why he's sending out 72 to reflect those nations from Genesis chapter 10. Then the question comes up is, why did he send these disciples out in twos. Wouldn't it make better sense to kind of split them up and then you'd have 144, right? Well, think of it this way. He refers to them as sheep going to lambs. The mission is difficult. People will not embrace or receive the message of the gospel. They're going to need each other. Why would they, church, why would they need each other? What could, what could possibly go wrong when you're on a spiritual mission trip? 
What could possibly grow wrong is you're walking into to various cities proclaiming that there's one king and that there's one way of forgiveness and there's one road to heaven. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? And so you would want emotional, get this, follow me, you would want emotional, relational support. Are you following me, church? Right? What I'm getting at is this. Why does Jesus send them out in twos? Because they're going to need each other. They're going to they're gonna need the, the, the support from one another. Christian, do you, do you follow the application here? The application is this, is that you were not intended to live the Christian life on your own. That you were intended to do life together. So when, when Ramon comes up and when David comes up, we're not just adding them to a list somewhere so that we can kind of report to some headquarters somewhere that we added this number of names to our membership role in the year 2019. A thousand times no. By adding those two brothers to the membership role of Grace Life, what we are saying is this, we are committing ourselves to you. You are committing yourselves to us. And together, by the grace of God, we are going to lock arms and hold one another accountable and march to the kingdom of God together. That is why Christ sent them out in two. And that's why you and I need one another. So the first response to the gospel is this. Pray and to go. I want you to look at verse 2 one more time. Where it reads this way. Jesus said to them, we could recall this Jesus' prayer request, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. I want you to note three facts about Jesus' harvest. Number one, the first thing I see about it is this. It's plentiful. There's a lot of it. Number two, we see that who is the Lord of the harvest? This is Christ's harvest. It is, he refers to, it's it's His. And what is the third thing about this harvest that we are to pray for? We are to pray for what? For laborers to go into this harvest field. So when James prayed for us this morning... And he prayed that God, the Spirit of God, would raise people up from this congregation. He was praying in accordance with Luke chapter 10, verse 2. So, just so that we're all on the same page here, right? We understand that we're not playing church around here. We we ain't playing that. We're not playing that game. We're serious that what we want to do is we want to see people go into the harvest harvest field for the gospel of the kingdom to be proclaimed, for people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like, that's what we believe. That's what we pray for. That's what I would urge you, even as your pastor, to raise your children towards. Not necessarily that they would go maybe into a a full-time capacity preaching like this, but however God would direct their lives. So if God places them in a business field, that they would be a Christian first in that business field. That if God places them in education, that they would be a Christian first in education. If God places them as an engineer, that they would be a Christian first as an engineer. Whatever God would have them do, that they would you see that as the platform for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, as they are going, what are they supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be praying. Jesus says we're to pray for more laborers because the harvest is plentiful. Now I have to admit, it doesn't feel that way, does it, at all times? It doesn't feel like the harvest is plentiful. We get a lot of no's before we get a lot of, before we get any yeses. There's Warren Wearsby. If you ever, Warren Wearsby just recently passed away, but if you ever see a book by the name of Warren Wearsby, you get it. It's, it's worth reading. Wearsby wrote this. It is laborers. It is laborers, not spectators who pray for more laborers. I continue with this quote. Too many Christians are praying for somebody else to do a job that they themselves are unwilling to do themselves. Christian, do you understand that you are God's answer to His own prayer request? That while we pray for missionaries and laborers to go into the harvest 
field, I want to say this right now, and I don't know who, I, I'm not clairvoyant, but I just, I, I'm looking at future missionaries and future pastors right here, right now. Like right now. Not, not the kids' church out there, like I'm looking at you, and I don't know who. And God's call for laborers is not from the big church five miles down the road. No, God's call for laborers is from within Grace Life Church. In fact, one of the greatest myths in the Christian church is that somehow calling is the, is, is the sacred experience for a special few, a select few. Well, no, church. The great commission to go and the great commandment to love is for all of God's people. And so whether you find yourself this week hitting the beltway and going to the north side of town, or hitting 99 and going south, or hitting 290 till you hit uh, you know, 45 and going whichever direction, I say to you this, that is your calling this week and that is your mission field. The apartment you live in, the, the home you live in, that is your mission field. The great commission to go and the great commandment to love are not confined to a specific, specially called. For God has called each of us in a role in every place to give the gospel and to make disciples of all peoples everywhere. It's to go and to pray. Here's the second response. It's found in verse 10. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. This is not the tender, meek, and mild Jesus that we see about or hear about, is it? What is the second response to the gospel? Even though that the harvest is plentiful, the second response is just this. It's people who hear and reject. Jesus continues. This has, been a, this has been a theme all throughout the Gospel of Luke. He continues this motif of hearing and heeding, of observing and obeying, of listening and, and learning. And Luke names, the author, Luke names three Old Testament towns. Three Old Testament cities. He names Sodom, which most of us in here would be aware of, right? From Genesis 19, where God rains down fire and brimstone. He names Tyre and Sidon, and that's found in Isaiah 23, and I believe Isaiah 36 as well. And he says to them that if the same works had been done in them that had been done in the various cities that he had ministered in, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Like, let me show you these three cities that he's calling out. Do we have it here? You see on the north side of, of Galilee over here, so Jesus is from Nazareth, and this is his Luke 1 through 9. His ministry is primarily in this area up here. And, uh, there's Chorazin up there. There's Capernaum, which would have been Peter's hometown, if I recall correctly, and there's Beth Bethsaida there. And Jesus is saying if, if the works that he had done here had been done in Tyre and Sidon or in Sodom, that those three towns would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus is teaching us this, that there is a stricter judgment for those who have heard and been exposed to his ministry. So, so don't, don't think this way, don't, don't think this way, that there's a stricter judgment for Vegas than there is for Houston. You know, it's actually the opposite. There's not a stricter judgment for Hollywood than there is for Houston. There's actually a stricter judgment for Houston, is what he's saying, because of the prevalence of gospel ministry. We, we could even put it this way, right? We could say it this way, that 
if the works that had been the works that were done in Houston had been done in Baghdad or Tehran or name your whatever city Jesus is saying to those of us who have grown up and been under the exposure of the Christian gospel that if we do not respond, that it's actually more tolerable for those who have not had as much exposure to the Christian gospel as it is to those who have had exposure to the Christian gospel. This is serious information. This is serious that if there's a stricter judgment for those who have heard and reject. Now, some preachers will, some preachers that you may hear or see will from time to time will say, you know, I don't like to talk about God's judgment when Jesus has just said to these cities woe to you woe to you three different times can I just say this to you grace life people who pastors or Christian leaders who refuse to talk about God's judgment those are not good Christian leaders right Jesus pronounces a woe and those who will not speak honestly about a person's impending doom are doing no good to the person's soul. A, 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 a Christian pastor, when a, when a preacher says, woe to those, to those of you who are, um, who are abandoning your spouse or abandoning your children, to, woe to those of you who prioritize your job above Jesus, woe to you who prioritize your love of sports above Christ and worship, woe to you for you know, shacking up. When a Christian pastor says that to you, that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Now certainly, there can be a judgmentalism within the Christian church that is not a helpful thing, but an honest pastor and an honest friend who accurately reflects the Scriptures and does so in the right tone. That is a good thing. And someone that you should not push away, but someone you should embrace. When you look at verse 16 of Luke 10, Jesus says this, the one who hears you, Christian, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Jesus is teaching us this, is that, Christian, when you give the gospel... I'm not talking about when you invite someone to church. When you give someone the gospel and you tell them about Jesus, when you give them the gospel and if someone rejects what you are saying, they're not actually rejecting you, they're rejecting whom? Christ. They're, they're rejecting the Father. That is, Christ sees His Word, His Gospel, and His identity so intertwined together that is to reject the Christian Gospel is to reject Jesus Himself and to reject the Father. I say... Friend, you're here and you're listening and you have not received the good news that Jesus Christ came to rescue and to save you of your sins. There would be no better day on this Father's Day, June 16th, 2019, than to receive the Gospel so that not only are you not under a stricter judgment, but even more important than that, that you have a true Father in Heaven. The, the responses to the gospel are this, to go and to pray, and then hear and some reject. And then finally, I want to give you the final response found in verse 17. After all that, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Man, you should have seen them falling left and right, Jesus. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Top that, right? Verse 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus says to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So here is the third and final response, and it is this, to repent and to rejoice. And here's what I mean. Repent, turn from your sin, and come to Christ. And then, find your joy. 
Not in what you have done, but in what Christ has accomplished. Rejoice. And what does he say to rejoice in? Rejoice that your names are written somewhere. Where are they written? In heaven. Did you know that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that your name has been written in heaven? So I didn't know that. Let me show you two passages from Scripture. Philippians chapter 4 is our first one. Can you have it there? Paul writes the, these words you know, to the very end of the book of Philippians. Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. Together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, here's what it is. Those names are in the book of life. You say, where's the book of life? Well, you could, you could maybe suggest that it's here in, in Luke 10, and then Paul alludes to it in Philippians 4. But I want to give you one more, and this time it's found in Revelation I believe 13, or maybe this is 21. The Apostle John writes, Nothing unclean will ever enter it. That is heaven. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know what Christian experiences you've gone through. This past year, we've gone through a, a very big experience as a church body. We've seen a building go up. Uh, we've, we've seen some people baptized. That would be worth rejoicing in. But what does Christ want you to rejoice in? He wants you to rejoice in this, not in the activities that you've seen or the accomplishments that you've been a part of. He wants you to rejoice in not an accomplishment that you have been a part of, but rather an accomplishment that He, that he established, that He founded, that He Himself did. What, what should you rejoice in? That your name is in the Lamb's book of life. Question, why is my name written there? How did it get there? Look at verse 21 of Luke 10. In that same hour, He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and He said, I thank You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that You have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. That is, He's hidden them from kind of the religious muckety-mucks of the day and He's given them to the plain, simple people of the nation of Israel. Revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was Your gracious will. Get this, verse 22. All things have been handed over to Me by My Father and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son. Did you follow that? Jesus is saying, listen, the true identity of the Father is only revealed to the Son, and the true identity of the Son is only known by the Father. But look at the last phrase of verse 22. And anyone... Get the, and anyone... And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Jesus is saying, all things have been handed to Me. No one knows who the Son is except for the Father. No one knows who the Father is except for the Son. Oh, and there is one other caveat. There is one other group. And it is this. Anyone to whom the Son has chosen to reveal Him, the Father, to. Rejoice, Grace Life. Christian, maybe you want to put it that way. Rejoice, Christian, because your salvation is not based upon your education. Your salvation is not based upon your intuition. Your salvation is based upon sovereign, divine revelation. The only way a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is this, when the Son reveals Himself to them. That's the only way. And so in this passage here in Luke 10, we have an amazing, amazing thing, right? we got pray that the Lord of the harvest, that He'll send forth labors into His harvest field. Why? Because there's, if there's plentiful, right? So you have human responsibility. But then in, chapter, in verses 22 through, or 21 through 22, what do you have? You have divine sovereignty. You have human responsibility and divine sovereignty side by side next to each other. And you can see verse 23. Then turning to his disciples, he said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. 
For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now, folks, we can use the word rejoice, right? That was the word I use, repent and rejoice. Or we can use the word worship. Worship, Grace Life. Because deep, joyful worship is the product of this knowledge. What knowledge? That the Son has revealed the Father to me. Of all the seven billion people on this earth, why, did I, why do I get this knowledge? Why do you get this knowledge? I have no idea. I got none. And you try to delve the depth of why you received the gospel and why, why do you receive the gospel and not your sister? Why do you receive the gospel and believe the gospel and not your mom? Why did you receive the gospel and not somebody else? Because God saw something great in you? No, in fact, just the opposite, God says. The foundation of why you are saved is simply this, out of the kindness of God's divine revelation. That is not to invoke any pride. In fact, in this passage, it actually spurs world evangelism. It actually is the foundation and it prompts world missions. It prompts us to preach and proclaim the gospel to anybody and everybody, not just the divine elect or the sovereign few, but to anybody and everybody. So I want to encourage you this way, Grace Life, to rejoice. To rejoice in the fact that the, that the Son has revealed the Father to you. What loosens your heart to worship? What, what gets kind of those achy knees going and those kind of unbendable Baptist arms up in the air? What gets that going? Is this deep, abiding knowledge and worship of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I have been given salvation in Christ? What renews my mind to rejoice? My name is in the book of life. What energizes my heart to worship? My name is in the book of life. What gives me boldness to come before the throne? What gives me determination to keep pressing on? What, what gives me all that is, that is this, is that my name was written in the book of life. This is what we rejoice in. This is what we worship. This is why we gather Sunday after Sunday to rejoice in the worship in this. So our main response, Christian, is this, to go, to pray, to rejoice or worship. And if you have not believed on the gospel, your one response is this, to repent, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember John Lake, that missionary we started off with? Remember Tai Cam Island, the lepers and the pirates? I want to show you a picture of the Cam Baptist Church. Lake would write this, quote, Each Lord's Day, it was filled with worshipers and pirates. Those pirates would often attend the services in the new chapel and they would sit up in the galley while the lepers would sit down below. And Lake would later leave the island because of medical conditions of himself and would travel to the United States raising money for the island and for the Decam Baptist Church. Do you know who took over the pastorate of the Decum Baptist Church? A former pirate. Because John Lake had prayed. Right? You remember the prayer? God would that you would even save these pirates and cause them to be allies in the cause of the gospel. I don't have this in my notes, but I remember this from the reading, and it just does my heart good to say it because I got to say it. World War One. I'm sure I get my dates right. It would have actually been uh, a little. Yeah, it would have been World War One. Uh, can't remember now if it was World War One or World War Two. But the island was bombed heavily. Must have been World War II. The bomb was uh, bombed heavily by the Japanese, and they were scared that the uh, the church was gone and everybody had been killed. Lake by then had retired to the United States and was still raising funds for Tai Kim Island and the Decum Baptist Church. 
So one of his friends who was still on the mainland of China actually took a boat secretly on a Lord's Day on a Sunday to find out what had happened. And yes, while the bombs had destroyed the, the village, the town, and well over a hundred of the lepers had been killed, there were three that gathered on that Lord's Day. And that missionary in China said, as he rowed his boat or it to the island, he could hear three voices singing praises to the Lamb. All because a man decided to go and to pray and to be faithful and give the gospel. Grace Life, I'm not telling you to go to a leper colony. I'm telling you to be faithful at your work cubicle. To be faithful in your neighborhood. To love the people that God has placed around you. And you know what? Someday these seats were all going to be gone. The people that we have faithfully shared the gospel. Some little boy who came to Backyard Kids Club this past week will be standing up here and will be preaching. Maybe he'll be bilingual and be preaching in English and in Spanish back and forth. But what we do now in obedience to Luke 10 has ramifications to those who follow us. Let's be faithful. Father, thank you for your prayer request of your Son, that we would pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest field. Father, raise up. I pray that there would be a holy haunt in this place that no one could escape the Spirit of God saying, Go. That we would be figuring out how to even rework budgets to help people get to the mission field. And, and maybe long, and Lord, long before any of that happens, it's going to happen because we're reaching people across the street and in our neighborhood and in our work. And it's going to start with a summer of prayer. It's going to start with a who's your one. And we're praying and we're inviting and we're nervous and we fail and we pray some more and we get back up again and we reintroduce ourselves and we do things that are completely out of our comfort zone. But we want to do it because we want to be obedient to Luke chapter 10, verse 2. And we want others to rejoice as we ourselves have rejoiced this morning that the Son has revealed Father to us. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I close this way. If the Spirit of God has been drawing your heart to Him, and I say that this way, that you have sensed the kind of the tug or the pull of the Holy Spirit at your heart, that's saying, that's, that's one way that God is saying to you, it's time to come to Jesus. I'm going to be out in the lobby, grab my hand, Say, I want to talk to someone about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, Father, we thank you. Send us out this week as sheep among wolves. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand.